Thank you. How many of you uh, had to wait at the highly personalized coffee station? <laughs> with all the, you know, that was great. And then I made the wrong choice after I bought, you know, I got the wrong coffee, so I'll have to go back. Actually, I love that, uh, that coffee station. So <clears throat> what we're going to do now in the second half of this pres- uh, second uh, conversation is I'm going to take you on a journey about technology. And this journey will likely melt your mind because things are happening so quickly. Technology is changing before we even realize it's changed. Right? And um, it's, it's uh, something that we need to think carefully about in education and how we will navigate this uh, new digitally saturated world. And the title of this presentation is about how we can achieve a fine balance. Because again, it's not about saying technology is going to disappear because it won't. It is relentless as a force and will continue to change. But increasingly, in my scholarship and in our work, we recognize that we have to find a better balance between the promise and the peril. So this presentation is really to kind of take you on that journey. And I don't have the quote here, but I'm going to ask you at the beginning of this presentation to think about a saying that a great Canadian scholar, Marshall McLuhan, I don't know if any of you have heard the medium is the message, but he was born in Edmonton, was a professor in Ontario, so he well represents our delegation between Alberta and Ontario. He said, we shape our technologies and thereafter they shape us. In which he actually ripped off from Churchill, who said we build our buildings and thereafter they build us. But it is something that we need to remember. Technology is not neutral. It's not just this thing. It actually comes with values and it reshapes our bodies physiologically, our relationships, and increasingly, we're finding, neurosynaptically, it's changing us. So this is really a presentation to talk a little bit about how we can achieve a fine balance. What I'm going to do is talk about same kind of a structure. What's going on? with technology, like what is happening? Then I'm gonna say, so what? So, so what does this mean? What does this mean for kids, for parents, for teachers, for school leaders like yourselves? And then I'll end it off with, now what? Right? Now what do we do about this, knowing that this is the future and uh, how we have to navigate it? So does this sound good? Can I still stick around or do I head back to Canada? Okay, somebody said head back. So let's talk about the what. What's going on? What, what really are the forces with technology? So I talked to you about choice, personalization, flexibility, and their balances, equity, community, and responsibility. Because in many ways, technology is driving a lot of the choice and a lot of this hyper-personalization, like the Facebook example that we had. And this idea of flexibility, that I can pull my iPad out or my phone, I can, you know, um, get access to what I want, where I want it. Technology is really a big part of these three seductions and their balance. So one of the things that we know about technology is that it changes rapidly. A rapid technological shift is in our future. Now technologies don't just progress on a linear line. They go exponentially. 2, 4, 8, 16. That's the power of technology. So this is a dangerous thing to do after lunch. But I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Okay? Close your eyes for a second. Hopefully you've had that coffee from that hyper-personalized machine. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine your home or your school or somewhere that you actually like to be. It could be in nature. A hundred years from now, What will your school, your home, or nature look like 100 years from now? And I want you to look around in that picture and imagine the technologies that you see around you. So what is that space like? What does it look like? Okay, get a firm image. Now open your eyes. 
I want you to take that vision that you thought would be 100 years, and it will happen in 20. In 20 years, what you imagine will take 100 years will happen. So here's an example. How many of you in this room have a cell phone that has a camera and email? So it's a phone with camera and email. Keep your hands up high so I can see. Okay, keep them up really high. How many of you had a... Oh, keep them up, keep them up. How many of you had a cell phone with a camera and email six years ago? Just like that, right? There's a few early adopters, right? But six years, this Swiss army knife of our time didn't exist. So if you think about that and talking to your grandparents about this wafer thin thing that can do incredible things, they would say, what? Right? They would wonder what's going on with our... So six years, imagine 20 years where technology will be. What that looks like is this. This is Moore's Law. Robert Moore, the founder of Intel, coined a law that will exist to about 2040. And in Moore's Law, computing power and capacity doubles every 18 months. So you buy a laptop, and 18 months later, you wish you had waited. And then another 18 months, you wish you had waited. This will continue to happen. So in my lifetime, this was the world's supercomputer in 1967. It had a processing speed of 0.25 MIPS and memory of 144 bytes. And it cost $14 million and would have filled up this room. Right? That's the size of it. If you sent a tweet, an email, or a text, you just blew that supercomputer away. Right? 1967. I can now buy a uh, laptop or a notebook in 2014 with 8 gigahertz of processing speed, a memory of one terabyte for $479. Every 18 months, up until you know, 2040 something, this will continue to happen. This is the world's most powerful computer in 2014. It's called Titan. And it's in the Midwestern United States, somewhere hidden. It has a processing speed of 20 quadrillion calculations. That's 18,000 laptops every second calculating information. It has a memory of 710 terabytes, and it's 100 million US dollars. Do you know what they use it for? I want you to guess. What do you think they use Titan for? Survey. What kind, of, what kind of use would you put this supercomputer? 18,000 laptops a second processing speed. Playing games? Playing games? That would be fun. <laughs> wow, the game is over before it began. I would not want to play chess with Titan. No? Somebody said military. Actually, Titan is used to model climate change. It's to model where the climate is changing and what the potential consequence and complexities are. So you think about the power of computing, and every 18 months it, it doubles. Well, Titan is as smart as a dragonfly. It's pretty smart, actually. Right? Um, 2059? Who knows? This will be a relentless force in our lives. It will appear in 20 years as if technology is magical, just like this would appear to our relatives as something that's just unbelievable, right? Magical. What's the internet? What do you mean you're able to, you know, find this information? So this is the nature of technology. I was in Ottawa, our capital city in our country, at a meeting with the vice president of Google, the head of Facebook, uh, two other professors. There was about 20 of us in the room. And, as I and the meeting was about youth and digital technologies. And as I left that meeting, I was at the airport, and I pulled up this Time magazine. And on the front of the Time magazine, it said, it promises to solve some of humanity's most complex problems. It's backed by Jeff Bezos, and NSA, and the CIA, NASA, sorry, and the CIA. Each one costs $10 million and operates at 459 degrees below zero. And nobody knows how it works the infinity machine. 
So being Canadian and Scottish, I read the whole article standing in line. Didn't buy the magazine. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, okay, this is interesting because this could be a black swan event. You guys know what a black swan is? It's a theory that says sometimes you get very low frequency events that have a huge impact on the world. Right? So the internet is one example. It's changed everything. Commerce, health, society. We didn't know it would be something that would be a low frequency when it came out, and then it changed everything. Well, could this quantum computer, that's what this is, be um, you know, a black swan event? Well, the company is called D-Wave. And guess where this quantum computer, which basically would take Titan and make it look like a Atari 1974 computer, right? That's how powerful they're claiming it. It operates in dual universes in quantum mechanics, right? And I'm a social studies English teacher, so don't even ask me what that means. <laughs> but D-Wave is out of Vancouver, the company. So I grabbed my Swiss Army knife of our times, and I sent an email to the CEO and chief um, director a, a man named Dr. Rose, who runs D-Wave out of Vancouver. And I said, my name is Dr. Phil McRae. I teach in Alberta. This is what I do for work. Can you tell me, what do you think this computer will do for education? What will it mean for education? Well, he wrote me back in under 10 minutes. And he said, thanks for contacting me. He said, I have some kids the same age as yours. And, you know, I, I just couldn't believe the reception to the Time Magazine article. And he said, I think we'll have computers teaching children, virtual tutors, and that will be the future. And I just about had a stroke. <laughs> I was like, how is this the vision of the future? So I wrote him back and I said, is that what you want for your children? Would you want D-Wave to teach your children? And he wrote back and he said, actually, no. I've never thought about it. But I want my children to have social skills in a relationship. I just know that the technology will appear artificially intelligent in the future. So how do we navigate this? So we don't know where things are going. But even the Einsteins of our day are asking questions now about what does this mean, robotics and artificial intelligence, for the future of things like teaching and learning. Where we're moving is to a place called the Internet of Things. Right now, more things, cars, televisions, fridges, are connected to the Internet than there are people on the planet. Right? More things are connected to the Internet than people on the planet. In 2007, that's when it happened. In 2007, more things were connected than people on the planet. Well, right now, in 2015, there are 25 billion connected devices. 25 little things that have an internet address that are constantly connecting back and forth, either in real time or you know, when they get connected up. Right? Think about that. That's 25 million billion sensors in our world right now connected to the internet. This is the LG fridge. Does anybody have this fridge that's connected to the internet? Still haven't met anybody that actually owns this fridge, but it exists. And this is what your fridge does if you own this internet of things, this internet connected fridge. You're driving home from school one day and your fridge is talking to your phone. It knows where you are in the world, right? Because you have this, trans it's called transactional cartography. It knows where you are in the world. And as you go by the store, your fridge says, your milk expired, Phil. You need to pull into the store now and buy milk. And by the way, go to the third aisle because it's on sale. And I know what milk on sale means. But this is what will happen, is it will monitor your food, it will know where you are in the world, and it will start to connect, right? It'll do nutritional mapping. It'll do all kinds of things. I will never be able to hide that chocolate bar in my fridge again. 
These smart objects are creating a mesh of pervasive information awareness. These 25 billion sensors are creating this kind of living sensor system around the world. You can now get robot vacuums that you can program from your seat here to start vacuuming your house. You can put your laundry on. If it's in there, you can start and stop it. And even tables now have surfaces or walls that you can touch that are connected to the internet. So we're quickly moving to a time where objects are called smart objects. Although when I told my wife this, and I was really excited, I'd been to New York and actually looked at uh, some of the things the military had been doing with smart objects. She's like, go clean the smart dust off the piano. <laughs> Google has a self-driving car. So this is the cartoon of their self-driving car, but it's not a cartoon, it exists. They've tested it out and people love it. Do you know why they're building a self-driving car? Because the Western world is aging and people like my parents soon will not be able to drive in their mid to late 80s. So this will give them flexibility and more choice of where they wanna go. And they'll be able to be moved around in a car that's connected to the internet at any time, at any place, and at any pace. I hope not at any pace. <laughs> not sure about the pace. And your coffee machine can send you tweets. Right? They have a coffee machine now that will tweet you. Your coffee's ready. Okay, I'm a foot away. You know? I'm sure my coffee machine will unfollow me after a while. Or I'll unfollow my coffee machine. Smart clothing <clears throat> is on the horizon, just over the hill. In 2007, I was at a conference and they were talking about smart clothing. And this is what smart clothing looked like uh, initially then. The military has shirts that exist that were in prototype in 2007 that are now being used, where if a bullet would go through the, the clothing, it releases a coagulant into the bloodstream to stop the bleeding, and it sends the blood pressure and heart rate to the medics coming on the scene and gives body readings on a constant basis. Firemen have smart clothing when the heat around them is changing too dramatically and they don't know it, we'll give them a sensor which says, get out of here, fast. This is a jacket when I was in, in uh, Finland that I saw, and I actually took a picture of it. It's a, called the mood jacket. And you throw the jacket over your head, and it reads the infrared signal of your face, and then it plays the type of music that you want to hear. So if you're too hyper, it plays classical to calm you down. And if you're not awake because you've just had lunch, then it plays disco trance to get you going. For children, they'll put them in cocoons in the future that will read breathing and heart rate. So things like sudden infant death syndrome will be something that in the future we'll start to hear and see at an early warning stage because they're constantly in a digital cocoon measuring their temperature and, and heart rates. For athletes, the new smart clothing doesn't just measure their speed at the end of a run, but at the nanosecond, will measure the oxygenation in your blood. I mean, that's the kind of things that are happening. And the last picture right here, you have to guess what this is. You have, it's my favorite picture. I can't believe it exists. What is that thing? Take a guess. Somebody's got to take a guess. Motorcycle suit. Actually, that would be interesting. No, this is a child, and that's playground armor. <laughs> it's playground armor if they fall off the slide. So, you know, when the parents are texting, because they're not watching their kids on the playground, and the kid falls off the slide, it sends them a text and says, your kid fell off the slide. Nokia patented the vibrating haptic tattoo. It exists where you can put a sensor into the skin, and when you get a phone call, your tattoo vibrates, you touch it, you can answer your phone. 
So now we will move from the Internet of Things to a blurring between the silicone and the carbon, we being the carbon, right? A blurring of boundaries between human and machine is not far off, right? So when we talk about smart objects, very quickly we will start to become a living sensor moving around. When I was in New York at this conference, I had a Blackberry then, and they said, okay, Phil, you need to put this little application on your Blackberry and then go into this big conference room with 500 other people. And so we put this application on and it asked for your name and your age and your background and, you know, not my bank card or my social insurance number, but basic information. And when you walk in the room, as you get close to somebody that has, you know, similar interests and likes, your phone vibrates, right? Yeah. Location-based social networking. It knows where you are in the world and it talks to another person's phone and then they vibrate if you, you know, have shared interests. My wife was not impressed. <laughs> Just saying, she was not impressed. Google Glasses, right? You put on the glass and it records the life stream, they call it, right? Goes through and records everything that's happening. This is what Google Glasses looked like in their first iteration. Does anybody have Google Glasses? Has anybody seen Google Glasses? Okay. Have you tried them on, Dr. Shirley? No? By the way, Dr. Shirley is here from New York, who's your keynote tomorrow morning. We think we should give him a hand. Our good friend, Dr. Shirley. So, in the future, 40 terabytes of information will be stored in Google Glasses by 2015. 40 exabytes by 2025 will be able to be recorded and stored. Doctors are using it in surgeries to see, let's say, in a heart surgery what's going on and map out virtuality on it. Athletes are using it because how many laps was that? You know? Children, though, at 40 exabytes, people are talking about recording an entire life from birth to death. I'm not sure why you want to do that, but there is talk about doing this kind of thing as we move forward into the future. And all of this is about big data, data being collected, tracking your habits, what can I sell back to you, right? Uh, driving along in my car, and as I come by Starbucks, hey, you need a Starbucks, right? I mean, this is something we need to keep a very close eye on. I wrote an article called The Rebirth of the Teaching Machine, which is about big data and children and protecting data privacy. If it hasn't come to Norway, I would encourage you to really think about how companies now want to access children's data in terms of learning and repackage and resell that data to parents, to school districts, to schools, because it's something that we need to keep a track of. In January 28th, they moved from this Google Glass to a much more embedded. You see this picture on the left? They're now putting them into glasses much more seamlessly. Doesn't look like you're you know, from Star Trek or something really weird. It's going to be in the future where these glasses, you won't even know it. They will be embedded into designer glasses and you won't even know what's happening. And soon, the patent already exists. Google owns it for contacts for Google Glass. They already know they can do it, where you put a contact in and it will create and record and send that information wirelessly, right? Which is going to be a huge problem for me because I will never win an argument again with my family because it'll all be recorded and they'll say, I told you so. <laughs> but, you know, technology will be present, but it will be absent. It will be there, but we won't know it's there. The Internet of Things is going to really raise huge issues for us around privacy and around, you know, what it means. Because uh, this will happen. Teachers will be recorded with their students. It will happen, right? I mean, this is already happening in Alberta schools where we had a young teacher who was being recorded in class and the student put the recording up on YouTube and it was in a, in a more conservative religious community and the parents said, why were you wearing that dress? What was, you know, I mean, this is 
She didn't give consent to be recorded. This was something that was, I mean, this will change the fabric of our world. And we need to start thinking about it, not just in society, but in education. You guys know what smart boards are out of Calgary? So year 2000. Right? I didn't have the heart to tell somebody at a school yesterday, but they had a brand new smart board. And I'm like, so year 2000. So pervasive monitoring, privacy in public places. What is this going to look like? Already there's applications. One of them is called Orasma, where you point at somebody, and if their phone has the information, it will register their biometric look, their face. It'll know who it is, and it'll say, oh, here's Jimmy Bob, 36, likes motor racing and kittens, recreates the video game Battle of Helm's Deep on the weekends. You know? Keep your daughter away from Jimmy Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. But privacy in public places, in schools, in society, will be an issue for us. And I love this. Dr. Couture gave me this cartoon. Here's Obama talking to a young kid. <laughs> dad says you're spying us online. He's not your dad. <laughs> uh, all right, I want to show you a short video. And it really tells you how we're becoming blind to progress. It's happening so quick, we don't even know that it's there. It's present, but it's absent. This is a video you can find online. It's called Everything's Amazing, But Nobody's Happy. Yeah, because everything is amazing right now, and nobody's happy. Like, in my lifetime, the changes in the world have been incredible. When I was a kid, we had a rotary phone. We had a phone they had to stand next to. And you had to dial it. Yes. You had to realize how primitive you're making sparks. <laughs> in a phone. And you actually would hate people with zeros in their numbers because it was more. Two <laughs> zeros. Screw that guy. Why <laughs> And then if, if they called and you weren't home, the phone would just ring lonely by itself. And then if you wanted money, you had to go in the bank. For, yes. It was open for like three hours. It was stay in line, wait for someone to check like an idiot. And then when you ran out of money, you'd just go, well, I can't do any more things now. <laughs> can't do any more things. Yeah, that was it. I mean, even if you had a credit card, they, but the guy would go, oh, can you bring out this whole shunk shunk and you're like, yeah, so you have to call the president to see if you're like, you have to call the president, yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Do you feel that we now, in the 21st century, we take technology for granted? Well, yeah, because now we live in, a, in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the, on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots <laughs> that don't care, because this is what people are like now. They got their phone that, ugh. It won't. Give it a second. Give it, it's going to space. Can you give it a second to get back from space? Is this what you're going to do? Yeah. 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 I, was on a, I was on an airplane and there was internet, high speed internet on the airplane. That's yes. the newest thing that I know exists. And I'm sitting on the plane, they go, open up your laptop, you can go on the internet. And it's fast and I'm watching YouTube clips. It's an, I'm in an airplane. And then it breaks down, and they apologize, the internet's not working, the guy next to me goes, this is bull <laughs> <laughs> Like, how quickly the world owes him something yes. he knew existed only 10 seconds ago. <laughs> Isn't that true? Everything's amazing, but nobody's happy. So I'm going to ask you now to reflect a little bit on that first what, some of the things that are happening. This is a picture of Chief Dan George, who's quite famous in North America. He was a uh, uh, very well-respected uh, Native American. And in Chief Dan George's life, he was born into a world where the primary mode of transportation was horseback, which was actually my father's life. He rode to school on horseback. And at the end of his life, Chief Dan George was watching on television a human being step onto the moon. So imagine that lifetime where you went from horseback to moon landing. So here's the question. Assuming you live to be 100, because with nanotechnology you probably will, how will the world 
that you were born into be different from the world that you're leaving. Okay? So think about that for a minute and share at your table or with somebody beside you. How will the world that you were born into be different than the world that you're leaving when you're over 100? Okay. Okay, if I can get your attention. So, I'm interested to hear how will the world be different, do you think? Does, does anybody want to share? I don't know if we have another mic or something. Somebody, something you talked about at your table, about how the world might be different. Anybody in the back? Front? I know how to wait. I'm a teacher. <laughs> I know about waiting. There we go. Right at the back we have a Okay. So th this question is a really good question to ask because it puts you into the mindset of things just have always been changing. So what might it look like? Okay. Uh, maybe we get uh, a chip operated into our uh, body who tells us uh, what we are doing. Or uh, if you want to go to a plane, uh, it just uh, reach out to your arm and they read it. Yeah. yeah, basically things are pre-programmed, right? And you get, wherever you go, it's, it's personalized, hyper-personalized. My PhD dissertation was on something called the echo chamber effect. And one of the problems that we'll face, and we're probably facing now, is that when you can get all of these different options tailored to you, you will only get what you want, when you want, how you want it. And you won't be introduced to randomness or serendipity or be walking along and just say, oh, maybe I'll go to this play. I have some time. Maybe I'll just bump into something new because everything is pre-structured and organized. And that echo chamber means you'll only hear what you want to hear. You'll only get what you want to get. And that will be a significant challenge. So I think in the future we need to, do you know the word serendipity? Have you heard of serendipity? It's a great word in English about randomness and chance. It just happens. We need to think in a world where that chip that just gets you, with, you know, into the theater uh, maybe sometimes is turned off so you can have randomness and just have a conversation or meet people you didn't expect to meet. Okay, so, so what? So what does this mean for us in education? Well, parents are different. There's a book written by Dr. Sherry Turkle of MIT, a book I would encourage you to read called Alone Together, Why We Expect More From Technology and Less From Each Other. And about seven years ago, the Alberta Teachers Association brought her into Alberta to have a conversation about technology. No, six years ago. And she said something to me that then she wrote in her book after the fact that I think is very important. From the moment this generation met technology, it was the competition. In many ways, children see technology as a main competitor for their parents' attention. Our childhood educators, our early learning educators in Alberta, are saying when they have the meet the teacher night, about a quarter of the parents are at the back of the room on their phones. So we are go to a restaurant Stand in line, and you'll see people alone together at dinner, restaurants, where it is. This is a significant thing that's happening around the world. And we need to think about what it's doing to our relationships, good and bad. Students in a digital age, they're also different. For them, the internet just is. If I were to come into this room, in Stavanger and say, you have electricity. This is amazing. You'd be like, where is this guy from? Go back to Canada. We accept it, just is. The electricity in this room just is. We don't even, we did not walk in here and think about this. 
For young people who've grown up with the internet and digital technologies, it just is. But they also have new views on authority. So when I was a professor at the University of Alberta, do you know what the number one source of information was ahead of the library and ahead of professors? Wikipedia. They would go to Wikipedia before they would go to the library or professors. So they have new views on authority. The first book I wrote called Celebrating School Improvement with my colleague, Dr. Jim Parsons. You know, it took like a year and a half to write this book and get it ready and published. And then, just like that, Wikipedia comes along. And I cried for days. <laughs> because we're no longer the source of authority. That's the changing dynamic. It's also changing relationships with police, with you know, everything is changing in terms of authority. It's not just information authority. It's authority generally is being shifted with a new digital generation that can get access all over the place. And this is interesting. It's another quote by Dr. Turkle. I share, therefore I am. Right? Which means they take a picture of their food and tweet it out so that they can basically shape who they are, their identity. I share, therefore I am. I don't exist until I share. Think about that. Huge identity things happening, right? And sometimes that's a real challenge when you're alone together and somebody's, you know, especially, I, I mean, I'm really freaked out about the future of Google Glass because, you know, your sharing is going to be in real time and it's going to be live. People are going to, you know, say, leave your glasses at the door, yeah. <laughs> right? Or there's going to be restaurants that say Google Glass, not a lot. Do you know what they call Google people who wear Google Glass right now? They call them glass holes. <laughs> I'm just saying. I didn't make it up. Anyways, I share, therefore I am. This is a, a, a Tumblr or a blog created called Selfies at Funerals. And it was a, a really, really interesting uh, blog that was put up because it was about people who had been at funerals or going to funerals taking these selfies of themselves. And the day that I saw this blog, I was going to the funeral of a mentor and a good friend of mine who was the dean of the faculty of education. And I was really angry that this was going on. So I actually put on this blog and wrote to, to people in social media about how this was, for me, I thought morally and ethically bankrupt. That what, is, what are you doing? This isn't about you at the funeral, it's about your respects. I had 10,000 people call back at me and get angry. I recognize that I'm in a different world now, right? Not everybody is like that, but, but this is the new reality where things are changing. A lady named Jane Twingay wrote a book called The Narcissism Epidemic, which was a follow-up to that 12 million person study about anxiety and depression that I talked about, her first book, Generation Me. And she said in their research, psychological research, that narcissism is on the rise and empathy is on the decline. Is that the kind of future we want, where we have a society? So maybe as we move forward, some of the things we need to think about in terms of digital literacy and 21st century skills is really how do we build more empathy into young people? How do we build long-term perseverance when they get everything from an app in a second? Because climate change will not be fixed by an app, I don't think. Children's playtime in North America. Since the late 1970s, children have lost 12 hours a week of free time, including a 50% drop in outdoor free play. How many of you would say it's similar in Norway in terms of just the feeling? Good, okay, so it's similar kind of dynamic. And there's lots of reasons for this. One is parents are afraid to let their children go play in the park. They'll get kidnapped. Um, kids are playing video games. The average eight to 18 year old child in North America spends seven hours and 45 minutes in front of screens every day. Television, video games, cell phones. That's the average age. Kaiser Foundation and Media Smarts, two big studies. Oh, it says, welcome. Welcome. This is not mine. Which one do I push? This one? The left one? Okay, good. Sorry. Not my laptop. Yeah. 
11 to 14 year olds is the group that we need to keep an eye on. And I would say in Norway as well. That's the group where media growth is the fastest. They spend four hours a day more than eight to 10 year olds. And the reason is because they're becoming more independent. They're getting cell phones and so on. So where you start to see the rise in things like cyberbullying and um, issues around safety and the internet is in this age of 11 to 14 year olds. That's where the media use is growing the fastest. So in terms of digital literacy, digital citizenship, safety, things like that, we really need to think about this group is where the media use is fastest. How many of you teach in schools or principal of schools where you have 11 to 14 year olds? Okay, there you go. Cell phone limits are being suggested now increasingly. And actually Scandinavia has led the research on this in the medical community about cell phones and heat, thermal impacts on young bodies. One of the big concerns in the medical community is that skulls of children are much thinner in terms of bone mass. And so they're not sure what's going on in terms of impact. And I think we need to start thinking about what this means. But kids don't talk on phones anyways, they just text. <laughs> this is the activity swing, right? You put the baby in, you throw the iPad on, and then you go have your personalized latte. Yeah. What really disturbs me about this picture is that you can move the iPad 127 different angles, but the kid is strapped in and can't be moved. The iPoddy for iPad. <laughs> mm. The greatest seller, actually, for this company is their iPoddy for iPad. Mm. Secretly, I want one for myself. I want to talk about it. No, I mean, this is disturbing, right? What are we doing? What are we doing? Developmentally, what are we doing? This was an ad for 7up from the 1950s. An actual ad, why we have the youngest customers in the business. And if you zoom in on that text, it says, this young man is 11 months old, and he isn't our youngest customer by any means. For 7up is so pure, so wholesome, you can even give it to babies and feel good about it. <laughs> well, this is the 7up of our day. We need to start thinking about the implications. The uh, Canadian Pediatric Society and the American Academy of Pediatricians, these are our, our uh, professional body that represents pediatricians in North America, have made recommendations for several years, almost a decade now, no screen time for children under the age of two. Zero. And over the age of two, we should have no more than two hours a day. Now, this is almost impossible. How many of you have more than two hours a day of screen time? Television, yeah. I mean, our new lived reality, it doesn't exist in there. So if we can't live by that, we need to be cognizant of why. For young developmental pre-kindergarten, preschool children, they need serve and return, the ability to connect visually and emotionally with an adult. The million word language gap, the more you speak to children, the better they do academically over time. But I wouldn't say it's just children. I would say this is for all of us, something that we need. You know, this is the so what. We need to think of a better balance. A good friend of ours and colleague, Dr. Michael Rich, Harvard pediatrician and uh, 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 practicing clinical adolescent and uh, pediatric doctor at Boston Children's Hospital, has said, you know what we need? We need to have four things for healthy brain development. Positive human interactions, that serve and return. Active connection with the physical environment. We've lost so much of getting our hands in the mud or being kicked outside when it's 30 degrees below that we need to get out and really develop those neurons by connecting with the environment. In a world of hyper-scheduling and over-scheduling, we need free play or constantly being entertained by our digital media. And finally, opportunities for creative problem solving. Dr. Rich and I, through the Alberta Teachers Association, launched about a month ago the world's largest study on technology health in children. And we will follow children from kindergarten to grade 12 for 10 years in Canada. And we'll look at their media habits. 
And one of the biggest things that we're concerned about in the current research is that the more time you spend on screen at night, the worse your sleep quality and quantity. That means readiness to learn is an issue. Kids come to school exhausted. Obesity rates climb when you have poor sleep, right? And guess what? It's not just kids. It's us. So what does this mean for policy? What should we be thinking about? You know, um, one of the things that is being thought of is that two hours before you close your eyes, you shouldn't, you know, be in front of screens. And the reason for that is the melatonin in your body is reduced when you're on screens. And 39% of our youth in Canada sleep with their phones. 39%. It's a recent study we just did. So we have to think about a better balance. And here's Duncan and my dad at the ranch. And one of the things that um, is important in a world where we're always on with smart objects and pervasively connected is where in our day do we save stillness? Where do we think about disconnecting in a world that will be hyper-connected? You know, I worry about showing up to a conference and my suit says, hey, Phil, get in the ambulance. You know, the ambulance pulls up. You're you know, having something wrong with you right now. We're going to be wearing our technologies. So how do we save stillness from a world that's hyper-connected? How do we think about that space we need for healthy development? Okay. So now what, right? Now what do we do? First of all, like the bear, there's lots of distractions. We have to be conscious of all those distractions. If I'm with my family or with you today or tomorrow, and you're talking to me and I'm looking at my phone while I'm talking to you, then I'm absent when I should be present. That's a distraction that we don't need because it's taking away from the relationship. It's no different with technology and kids in terms of enhancing learning. If it gets in the way of the relationship, it's a problem. If it's enhancing, extending, or building a relationship, then it's something that has real possibility. So three things that I want to share with you about now what? Here's number one. You ready? Number one is... Curriculum and pedagogy before technology. If you think about how you use technology in classrooms, there's something called TPAC. So the website is tpac.org. And it's a framework of how to introduce technologies. So what you do is you first think about the curriculum or the content you're teaching. Then you think about the pedagogical approach that you want to use with that curriculum. And then you pick the appropriate technology. For too often, I've seen technology first and pedagogy and curriculum after. But in many ways, it's this interconnected thing where you have to think of the curriculum that you want to teach, the pedagogical approach, and then the technology. And guess what? If the technology is not going to work for your curricular goals, then don't use it. If the technology will do things that will extend and enhance and engage students, then how do you use it with which pe pedagogy, right? And I won't spend a lot of time because this is very well thought out. How many of you have heard of TPAC? Yeah, so very, very popular now because it's practical and usable, and I would encourage you to look at that framework, right? So you can get some ideas. That's one. Number two. In a world which is connected all the time, my concern now is about children and their ability to bounce back from challenges or bounce back from adversity. Because if the chip is constantly giving you the answer, if you're constantly getting things fed to you instead of fishing, right, it's going to reduce resilience in young people, the ability to bounce back. There's a great book that I read by Andrew Zoli, and it's called Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back. And I would encourage you to take a look at this because I think in a digitally connected future, one of the things that we need to use technology for, but also you know, think about carefully, 
is how are we building resilience? And he talks about, well, you need for resilience, you need good physical health, you need quality social networks. Just because I have 2,000 people following me on Twitter or 1,000 friends on Facebook doesn't mean you have friends, right? The paradox of digitally connected isolation, that you're connected but you're disconnected. We've started to see this in young people who've uh, committed suicide in schools or others, is that people said they had so many friends on Facebook and so many friends on Twitter, but they didn't have anybody who they could actually connect with, the relational space. So this is a really interesting book about building resilience because I increasingly, we see in our research, principals who are in the, in the field are talking about young people being more fragile than ever and needing that resilience. Which leads me to my third and final, now what? And it's a very, very surprising one. <laughs> it's about relationships, relationships, relationships. If the technology, and technology enhances them, then it will make a difference. If it takes away from them, you need to ask yourself, is it worth it? Because that is the work that we need to navigate so that it doesn't become in the way, it doesn't distract, it goes back to what I said this morning in terms of relationships. So with that, I want to thank you for spending the morning and the afternoon with me. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>